to come in spirit and in truth, sincerity of heart. If Jesus could submit to the Father, even though they are the same, then you and I have no business not submitting or obeying the commands of Jesus Christ. We have no business doing anything outside of Jesus' commands and his ways. Jesus is the real prototype. He's the one we're following. He's the one we're becoming like. And everything he is, is what we have to be. We don't have our own ideas. We don't go with popular opinions. We stick with Jesus. We follow what Jesus wants. Even if they say we are fools, it's okay. Even if they say we are not trending, it's okay. I would rather not trend than trend for the wrong reasons. The only one that should trend is Jesus and I'm satisfied with that. I don't even bother to want, I don't struggle. I don't even think of it, let alone start to struggle with his glory with him. I don't need it. He's the one that will be glorified is the one that should be glorified. Is the one the world needs to see. Not you and I with our pretty faces and our gifts. So if all your gift is doing for you is producing more followers for you, but not followers for Jesus, there is a problem. If all we are doing with our gift is having more followers for us and not for Jesus, there is a problem. Because our existence is to point people to Jesus. But how do you even point people to a Jesus you do not recognize? So you understand why you need to behold. The more you behold, the more you know him. The more you behold, the more you become like him. If you don't behold him, you can't recognize him and you cannot direct people or point people to a Jesus you cannot recognize. I always say, I do not have to speak if Jesus doesn't want me to. There's no need. When I think of the cost of the anointing, the anointing is not, <laughs> I'm looking for the right word. I'm not, the anointing is not so important to me, really. Because the anointing is costly. When I truly think of it, the anointing is costly and so it's not an attractive thing for me. Though the anointing is attractive to the world. But the, for the one carrying it, it's not attractive. It is the burden of the Lord. It is the yoke of the Lord. Yes, with him it's easier but it's still a burden and it's still a yoke. So the anointing is not cheap. I say to people who are always quick to want to showcase their anointing, I doubt if you truly have any anointing. Because if you have it, if you pay the price in a true consistent walk and relationship with God, you die and God alone is glorified. You are never quick to want to showcase anything. If what you are carrying is authentic and is genuine, you don't 
you're not quick to want to show yourself. Nah. You die daily. Your every encounter with God causes death to happen to your flesh. Your every, our every communication with God causes death to our flesh. Because the flesh needs to die anyways. Self needs to die anyways. Personal ambition needs to die anyways. Personal gain and interest needs to die anyways to be able to do Jesus. You know, earlier in my life, I used to feel, you know, like I can sing, you know, I'm gifted. I mean, I knew I was gifted from when I was little. My mom kept saying it to me. And then the Lord revealed it to me when I was nine. And I gave my life to Christ when I was nine. So I knew I was gifted. Um, I think one of the hard times I will say I, have, I had was saying to myself, do I have to use this gift for Jesus? Why can't I use it for other things? I had that. I had that struggle. And then after a while, I realized one thing I can tell you from that, don't struggle with God. The more you struggle, the more you waste your time. The earlier you submit, the better. And so I knew I was gifted. I, I had the gift, you know, writing, the songs come, you know, speaking. I saw myself speaking in front of thousands of people and singing in front of thousands of people. So I felt, yeah, 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 I had it. And I remember coming to my then church. This was now some years later. And um, I got to the church and the worship was amazing. The, the, you couldn't, the choir was amazing. It was heavenly. But then when I got close, I realized that some of the choir members couldn't even sing a note to save themselves. So I was wondering, so what was covering them? It was the spirit of God. The Lord would rather have a sincere heart than have a beautiful voice. He would rather have a true heart than have an amazing, fantastic tone. So when I got there, I was like, wow, these people can't even sing. So after a while, I was like, why are they not letting me lead? Why are they not letting me take the lead? And why is that person that can't even hold a note taking the lead and all of that? And guess what? The Lord frustrated me. For as long as I was struggling with him, I was frustrated. And I never got to be given the mic to sing any lead of anything. Even when I got close to it and I had practiced and everything was going all fine and I thought, fantastic, I'm going to show my gift now. The next day, the day before the, the ministration, they said, oh, no, 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 you can't lead. They gave my friend the mic to lead and said, you know, a big man of God is coming. You know, you're not up to that yet. And I was angry. And the pastor said to me, oh, you, you're not gifted, okay? If, if you look at that person, that person is gifted. Look at the other person he was telling me. Look at the other person, that person is gifted, but you, you're not. And I remember saying, because I could be stubborn, you know. I remember saying to the pastor, I looked at him in the eyes and I said, thank you very much, but you're not my God. Whatever God says concerning me will stand. I mean, I knew what the Lord said concerning me, by the way. And I said that I was angry, I cried. I went home and I cried and cried and cried and cried. I was saying, God, what's the problem? You said I'm gifted. I know, not even said, I know I can see the manifestation already in me. So how come you're not giving me the mic? Excuse me. How come you're not letting me lead? How come you're not? How come can they see my gift? I mean, the people can attest to the fact that I have the gift. But yet I was not given the opportunity. 
And I was very angry and I was saying to God in tears, hot tears, like hot tears. I was saying to him, Lord, what is it? Look at what the pastor said. Why would he do this? Why would he do that? And I cried and cried and the Lord said nothing. And when I was done crying and I was quiet, then the Lord said to me, so if I may ask, this is the Lord speaking, if I may ask, who do you want to sing for? And I said, you, of course. Who do you want to minister for? I said, you. Okay. Who do you want to speak for? You, Lord. I mean, it's obvious. And then he said to me, so if it's me you want to do these things for, don't you trust me to give you the appropriate time, the appropriate time and the right time to do it? And that the venue and the stage and the time and the platform, whichever one you want to do it. That can't you trust me enough to do that when the time is right? And I was like, okay. Mm. And I started to think, really? Because that's what happens when you behold the word of the Lord, when you behold God, when you behold his glory, you see yourself, you see your limitations, and then you reach out for his unlimitedness. And it started to dawn on me that really, is it Christ? And when I evaluated myself that day, I realized that I wasn't really interested in showcasing Christ. I just wanted to show that I was gifted and I was better than these people who were being given the opportunity. That was what I wanted to do. Because if truly I'm saying it's Jesus I want to represent, can Jesus give, give me the platform? Won't Jesus give me the platform? Won't Jesus give me the stage? If Jesus thinks it's time, will Jesus stop me from being heard? No. Jesus won't. Except if I want to do it for another reason. But if it's Jesus I want to do it for, Jesus will present to me the right platform at the right time. And immediately, like Isaiah, when I saw the Lord and I saw myself, I started to ask for mercy. And I said to him, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry. I wanted to do me. Really, if it's about you, I should trust you enough to give me the platform. Even without a platform, I have a platform already with him. Listen to me. You have a platform already with him. Your secret place is your platform. Your secret place is your platform. Nobody can take from you. That's the real platform. That's the authentic platform, the secret place. If we have that platform, there is no way we will not be heard to the ends of the earth. If we keep that platform pure and burning, there is no way the ends of the earth will not hear us. We have to love that platform. It's a platform of obscurity. We have to love it. But a lot of us don't love that platform. We do a little bit there and we're quick to want to be on the big platforms where people can see us and appreciate us and appreciate our gifts. And so I repented that day and I said to him, Lord, I'm sorry. You know what? I will not struggle again. These were my words years ago. I will not struggle again. I'm fine with whatever you want. I'm okay. Even if I never get to sing this, I'm, I'm, and I'm not saying these words, you know, to just, I meant them. I said to him, even if I don't get to sing anymore, it's good. Even if I don't get to speak, they don't give me, I'm fine. And I was happy. And I went back to church serving, not looking for the mic to lead, nothing. And I did that for another two years. And guess what? The Lord didn't give me a mic in that church. 
but I was serving with joy. I had come to die to the place of wanting to be heard and to be seen. I literally died. Like Abraham died to giving Isaac, he died to it. He literally gave Isaac and the Lord made provision. That was what happened to me. I died to the idea, to the taste. I, I didn't want it anymore. And I was happy without it because I still had my platform with him. The secret place. Two years after, or more, then the Lord gave a platform nothing the church somewhere else entirely and that move birth a lot in the lives of the people and even the kind of worship we're experiencing now in my country why did i say this story i gave my life to christ when i was nine I knew what God said concerning me. My mom had been saying it and then the Lord showed me. So the word of the Lord over my life was true. It wasn't a lie. But yet it did not happen until his appointed time. But before that time, I was in his presence, in the secret platform with him. So if he wants you to do it, you know he's been prophesied, you've heard it, you've read it, that the hand of God is upon you. To represent Jesus, I believe. Then, be satisfied with Jesus' timing. Be satisfied with Jesus' appointed time. Be satisfied with doing it the way Jesus wants and not your idea. This scripture says in Psalm 17, 15, it says, As for me, I shall behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with beholding thy form. As for me, I shall behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake beholding thy form. That should be our satisfaction, beholding. So any pastor, any worship leader, any evangelist that doesn't love to behold the word cannot represent Jesus. You can't represent him. You need to be satisfied with him taking all the glory. Every good thing the Lord will do through you will come from the place of overflow with Him. In that place where you and Him communicate, the overflow of that is what people will see. So it is important first to understand that God is the one you are ministering to. Can I tell you this? You can't minister to the people of God. Only God can minister to the people. You can't change anyone's heart. There is nothing good that you can say that can change a man's heart or life. Only God can. So you need to understand the importance of first ministering unto the Lord. Let the Lord be pleased, then the Lord will do his work. Our job as ministers of God is to minister to the Lord and the Lord in turn will minister to his people. You minister to the Lord and the Lord in turn will minister to the people. Can you heal the sick? 
Can you raise the dead? And if you tell me I can because Jesus lives in me, yes, it's still in the name of Jesus you raise the dead. It's still in the name of Jesus we heal the sick. We never do it in our name. It will always be in his name, not our names. So it is important to let him, our devotion, our attention is on him. And then he will do what he wants with the people. Don't look at the people's faces to give them what you think they want. Every time we try to do that, we only just mess things up and we end up killing the people. We can't give anyone what they want. We don't even know what they need. Jesus knows what they want. He knows what they need and he has made provision to solve their problems. We just need to get to Jesus so that Jesus can get to them. And our soul is so precious to Jesus more than the ministry we do. Jesus is the ministry. Jesus is the ministry, not nothing else. So if we're not preaching Jesus, we are doing us. I always use the word and people will be like, oh, don't be too spiritual. And I'm like, I'm not too spiritual. I say, when they ask me, how is your ministry going? I said, no, his ministry is going well because it's his ears, it's not mine. The minute I start to call it my ministry, then I start to treat it like my ministry. The minute I start to say, oh, my ministry has gone far, I start to take decision as my ministry. But every time I'm reminded that it is his ministry, I'm reminded not to take any decision of my own. It is his ministry. I have to defer to him. I have to ask questions. And that's how we must be. We have to defer to Christ. We don't have a ministry. It is the ministry of Jesus Christ. And we have to defer to him every time. To ask, what are you saying, Lord? What do you want done, Lord? What should we say, Lord? What should we be doing now, Lord? That's how we need to operate. We don't have a ministry. If there's anything you take, I've said a couple of things, but I want you to put this down. You do not have a ministry. It is Jesus' ministry. Jesus is the owner of his ministry. I don't have a ministry. You don't have a ministry. Jesus has his ministry. It is Jesus that is the ministry. And all we are doing is doing Jesus. Whatever work he has placed in your hands is his. So you have to ask him what he wants. I also said, what we behold, we become. What we behold, we become. And when, you, when we become what we behold, then we know who we are. When we become what we behold, then we can operate like who we are. The ambassador to a country knows who he or she is. He's not trying to find his or, I, I, or her identity. He knows, she knows. So when you behold who Christ is, you become like him and then you know who you are and you can function from that place of who you are. And I also said, if Jesus can humble himself, though he's the same as God, but didn't count it robbery to submit himself, then you and I have no business not submitting to Jesus and doing exactly what Jesus wants. We have to submit to him and do exactly what he wants. The day we stop beholding, that's the day we die. You can be alive and be dead. 
This, the day we stop beholding the word of the Lord, we are dead men walking. The day we stop beholding this truth, we are dead men walking because we are just walking without any idea. We are walking with our idea. We are working with popular opinions and it's important in these times we are in where things are going to be so blurry and you can't even tell white from black. We need to be able to stay with the word. We need to be able to stay with the word. I also said beholding is important. Beholding is extremely important. The life of a believer is a life that is hinged on beholding. The life of every believer is a life that is hinged on beholding. If you don't see Christ, you can't do Christ, you can't talk Christ, you can't live like him. Your life as a believer is hinged on beholding. So what are you beholding? What are you seeing? What has been in your view? What have you been seeing and looking at and hearing? What has been your consumption what have you been consuming because never forget what you behold you become i pray that the lord will give us the grace to not be tired of beholding this true word of god I pray that we will love the word of God. I pray that we will live up to our responsibility. I pray that we will live up to our name. If we want to be ambassador for Christ, we have to live up to our names. I pray that we will live up to what Christ is expecting of us. And let me tell you, he wants to help you. He doesn't want you to do it on your own. You just need to submit yourself and come to him and say, help me. You need to come naked and unashamed. And the fact that you are doing Jesus doesn't mean you won't have weak days. Doesn't mean you won't have bad days. But if you approach him in spirit and in truth, you're able to come naked, unashamed to the one who can fix you, to the one who can help you, to the one who can make you stronger, to the one who can teach you to become like him. One of the things I've also noticed with, with, with us, you know, believers, ministers of God, preachers of the gospel, worshippers in whatever capacity. We sometimes find it so hard to be true to God with where we are at. Sometimes we lie to people, we tell people because we come and we present something to people and people think, oh, we are cool. And we take that same step into our secret place and want to lie to God. We can't lie to God. He sees all things. And it's important we come to Him knowing that he sees and he's the one that can help us. To everyone you can be the man of God. To everyone you can be the woman of God. To everyone you can be the anointed prophet. But to Jesus you are still a son. And so we should be able to come on a shame naked and be free to tell him where we are at and ask for his help 
I pray that the words I've spoken will find root in you. Sometimes people want you to say something different, but this is it. I don't have anything else to say. You know, sometimes we don't love the truth as well, but this is it. There's no life without the Word of God. Yes, praying in tongues it helps us to build our most holy faith. Yes. But after that, we come to the Word. We pray the Word. We sing the Word. We teach the Word. We prophesy the Word. Nothing out of the Word of God. For every believer and every servant of God. So whatever position you find yourself, don't be ashamed to tell Jesus how it is. Remember that Jesus is the one you're trying to represent. And the Jesus you want to represent is willing to teach you his ways. He's more than willing to show you his path. He's more than willing to show you how he operates. Because he wants, he wants you to do it effectively. So he's willing to teach you. He's willing to disciple you. He's willing to go through the journey with you. And if you will not forget this, never come to Jesus as a man or woman of God. Come as a child. I come naked and not ashamed. I come naked and not ashamed. You know my weakness. You know my strength. You know my weakness. You know my fears. You see my secret thoughts. You know my heart. I can be real with you. I can be real. Lord, I can be real with you. I can be real. We come naked and not ashamed. We come naked and not ashamed. You know our weakness. You know our strength. You know our weakness, you know our fears. You see our secret thoughts, you know our hearts. We can be real with you, we can be real. Lord, we can be real with you, we can be real. So we lay our burdens, we lay our cares, we lay our worries, and we lay our fears. Jesus, please help us, save us from us. We can be real. This song is called the song for the journey. I call it the song for my journey. That's what the Lord ask, is asking from me, to be real with him, to come without pretense, to come without any preconception or pre whatever it is, to just come bare and truthful before him. No matter how far I've gone in the journey, I would always need Jesus. No matter how far you've gone in the journey, you will always need Jesus to show you what to do. No matter how well you think you know the journey, you will always need Jesus. We will always need Jesus to show us what to do. So this song is called the song for my journey because I can always go back. Because sometimes in the course of doing him, I can miss him. But I can always be true to myself to go back and say, Lord, 
Am I on the right track? I'm willing to stop at nothing, lay down everything until I make you Jesus proud. That's what I want. And I believe that's what you want. Like I said earlier, I thank God for you. We commend your faith. We thank God regardless of the hardship of declaring for Jesus. We are grateful that there's, there's still a people in China. Regardless of how the government tried to make it so hard, we thank God. And our prayers are with you always. And we know that the mighty move of God is going to happen. A mighty revival will happen that will make you break forth. Nothing will be able to contain you anymore. No one will be able to contain you. I believe the Lord has spoken to you. And again, thank you. For the opportunity and privilege to speak his word to you. As we go into his time of worship, I know that the things I have said will be well expounded to you by the Holy Ghost even more in the name of Jesus. Thank you, ICFC. God bless you. And I know when I hear from you, it'll always be joy and good news. <laughs>